All right. Hello, everyone. Oh, that was, that's okay. I mean, it's Friday. Come on. Hello, everyone. All right. So much better. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us here at the Crossroads of Ideas, where we're exploring palettes, pigments, and perception, watercolor connections. Uh, so the alliterations always get me. So my name is Andrew Hannes. I'm the director of the Illuminating Discovery Hub here at the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery. And I should probably stick to my prompts. My, uh, my tendency is to go off in tangents from time to time. But that is me in a nutshell. We do all things science and art fusion. And this Crossroads discussion is a longstanding uh, program here at the Discovery Building. And so we're excited to have a little bit of infusion of art and science in it. So today's event marks the fall's third installment of the Crossroads of Ideas program. And it's a collaboration of research across the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery, Morgridge, and Wharf, which I think I just said, right? Uh, the series addresses issues that matter to all of us and are also subject to research at UW-Madison. Since 2014, Crossroads has been a staple of public programming offered at the Discovery Building on UW campus. And before I say more about this event tonight, uh, I just want to take a moment to give a proper land acknowledgement because the University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place that the nation has called De Jope since time immemorial. In, in, er, ugh, in an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both the federal and state governments tried repeatedly, but unsuccessfully, to forcibly remove Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. This history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. Today, UW-Madison and all of the Wisconsin Science Festival presenting organizations respect the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation and the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. So today, uh, you know, our mission is to cultivate curiosity and communicate the power of knowledge and creativity to change our worldview is really, uh, the, I guess, against the ethos of the crossroads of ideas. Uh, to do this, we're thrilled to have a wonderful panel of three experts who are all local uh, to Wisconsin here, or Madison, um, coming from a couple of different places. And I'll introduce them all briefly, but I'll also give them a proper introduction when they come up to speak uh, each. And so I'd first like to start off by introducing Kate Walsh, Caitlin Walsh. She is, I'm gonna read my bio here. Using inspiration from both form and function of human anatomy, Caitlin Walsh explores her paintings through the obscure dynamic beauty hidden within the body. With a studio located just up the road in Wanakee, Caitlin is an independent artist specializing in abstract, anatomical, watercolor, and oil paintings. Through her studies, she has found that the human interior looks deceptively chaotic and haphazard. But what if we could find the profound in the seemingly mundane? Her work seeks to do this by unearthing the stories inherent in our anatomy. She hopes to inspire a tradition of respect and appreciation for the overlooked. Caitlin, will you please join me on the stage? Or take over. <laughs> and we have to switch slides. always a surprise. All right, guys, I'm your first speaker today for palettes, pigments, and perceptions. That does work well, that alliteration, that is nice. All right, I want to start out first by introducing myself. He told you a lot about myself, but I'll tell you more, a few more details. I am Caitlin Walsh. I am an anatomy artist, and how did I get here to being an anatomy artist? Um, I've always loved art and science, like loved, always been fascinated by it. And that led kind of inevit inevitably in my mind to a degree in medical illustration, um, got that in UIC down in Chicago. Um, and with that degree, I ended up starting a business that I called Lion Road Art. 
um, where I do kind of these abstract or fine art representations of anatomy. People always ask why I named it Lion Road Art. It's because um, I lived on Lion Road when my child was born super early and he was sick for a long time. And that's when I started painting um, the, these kind of fine art representations just as a, as a mental outlet. So to commemorate that time, that's why I went with Lion Road Art, even though it doesn't sound very anatomy-esque. Um, I, my store has been around for, or my shop has been online for almost a decade now. We're coming up on nine years and uh, sold a lot. I think I'm in every, almost every country except Antarctica. Haven't made it there yet. Um, maybe someday. And, but recently, about a year and a, uh, two years ago, we moved to Wanakee, um, and I have an actual physical store now where I teach classes, um, and we, I print and ship around the world, so it's a lot of fun. And the last thing about, oh, and I have children. Two of them are here. The other one's homesick. Um, and that, that's me. That's Caitlin. So what am I going to talk about quickly in the next 10 minutes? I'm going to talk about the color of science. Then my colleagues here are going to go over the science of color. So think of me as kind of giving you your basis, your real world examples. And then some of the colors that I mentioned, they're going to reference um, later on. So they'll all be interconnected crossroads, if you will. My job, what defines my work, is basically I take things that are icky, ew, gross, people have a visceral reaction to it, and I make them not gross. I try to make them beautiful. I'll give an example of that after, right after this slide. Uh, and color is absolutely key for that. Uh, while beauty, for me, is more important than accuracy, because otherwise things won't sell if they're pretty, Using different colors and having a knowledge of color allows me to keep things super accurate and super precise, but not, not gross anymore, just through a quick little color change. Although I will say that a lot of my abstract work, it, I flirt with not being that accurate, but hmm, it, it still sells, so it's fine. Um, I, I'm allowed, obviously. I'm my own boss. I can use any color I want. But I've kind of put together a set of rules that I have to follow. Um, and it's based on, um, one, a gut feeling, but also uh, what has sold over the past decade and what uh, commissions I get from providers um, and hospitals. They know what patients like, what, pe what people like to see. And then those are the things that I um, actually get, the colors that I'm actually asked to use. So this is my example of something that's, ew, it's kind of gross. Um, this is a dissected heart. And then on the next slide, you'll see all I really did was change the color. And this, this is a hot ticket item. Pe people love it. And really, I mean, I added, I refined some areas, but it still is that dissected heart. And it really was just a color change that made it not icky anymore. Yay. So what I'm going to go through, I'll try to be nice and quick, but I'm going to go through each color and kind of tell you my tips and tricks, my do's and don'ts, and also I'm going to name the pigment that I use because um, so that when uh, Kristen talks about it, you'll have heard some of these. So for red, my choice is cadmium red. Cadmiums are a little bit poisonous, rumor on the street, but it's totally worth it because it's the best red. And cadmium yellow is the best yellow. So I just you know, tell my kids not to eat it. But unfortunately, my don't is use it. Don't use it when you're trying to make things not gross. Because as you can see from this dissection painting that I was commissioned to do, so I was told to do red, uh, it, it, it's a little too intense. It makes people think of blood. So if you do have to use it, um, I very much recommend doing a more abstracted piece, um, like this aorta or this uh, carotid artery. This is where I, it's accurate, sort of. Um, and it works, even though it's red, it's still, it still sells all right. So for oranges, I don't know about the other watercolor artists here, but I like to mix my own oranges. I don't like orange out of a tube. And to mix it, I use that cad red and I use cad yellow as well. Um, so that's just personal preference. I get the best range from that. I don't usually make plain orange paintings. Um, I usually mix, uh, pair them with another color because they look good with so many other colors. So you can see with this kidney, this is a dissected kidney. I paired it with a dark teal and a, and a dark green. And um, I like it. Turns out nice. Uh, this one's paired with some beachy colors, uh, summery colors, and it packs a punch too. And this one, I, the orange you can see is paired with so much of that red-violet color and a little bit of black, and it just, it's a great punch of color that pairs well, well with other ones. They're my orange tips. 
Yellow is similar to orange. I use it as a, a nice pop of color here and there. Um, I would say, again, unless you're specifically asked to, another dissection where I was asked to be super specific, don't use yellow when you're painting anatomical fat because it's too close to reality and it's, it's icky. Um, do instead pair it with other colors for nice pops of color. So you can see in this one, I, on this, uh, these are the bones of the skull. I paired it with a nice purple and blue. And then here I used plain yellow, but I anchored it with that, with that blue and it kind of um, works as a, with a buddy system, having another color. Green, I like greens. Uh, they're really having a moment these days. They're, they're very trendy, I tell you. The only green that I really use is phthalo green because from that phthalo green, or is it phthalo? Oh, I, I heard you say phthalo the other day. Okay, I'm gonna go with phthalo today. Uh, it, I can mix any range of green that I want, so it's a nice, it's a nice starting off point. Um, when you're using greens, don't, look, don't make it look like gangrene. That's the way I feel about this painting. It's a little bit corpsey, a little bit gangrene, so don't do that. Um, instead, uh, I like to get rich and dark with my greens. A lot of times, since this is a watercolor specific talk, greens start to get really pastel. You gotta get impactful with that green like I did on this Meridian's painting. Um, and then using a range of greens together is always good. Sometimes people forget that that chartreuse is still a green and it pairs so nicely with a few other greens that it just looks very organic, very nature-y, science-y, if you will. So it's kind of, uh, they're having a moment now. I feel like they were kind of an underdog for a while, um, but I really, really like, oh, I forgot, <laughs> I forgot to put this one away. And this is an anal sphincter. I just wanted to show that if you use the right colors, it looks really nice. People. <laughs> buy this and put this on their wall. I'm pretty sure they know what it is. <laughs> Teals. Um, teal is not a Roy G. Biv color, but I had to add it because I get asked to paint in teal all the time. So I said don't get bored with it because it's everybody's favorite. Um, do make it look oceany. Um, find a range of teals. It's not just straight blue green. You can find quite the range as in this hematology painting. Um, and it, teal looks nice subdued with the opposite, it's opposite on the color wheel, which is a pinky reddish orange. I like this example because it shows all of those dews. It's a very oceany look to this cell. Um, I subdued it, it's a, it's a more, it's a less saturated um, range of teal. Um, I did that by adding pink and red to it. And uh, it's, it uses a range of colors. So I, I like that one and has that pop of orange. Uh, this is another one you can make anything look good. In teal, this is a uh, the fetal skull coming out of a pelvis during birth. Um, it's fine. Don't look too closely. Uh, and then this one is that oceany feel. It's a cerebellum, but I try to make it look like coral, and it's pretty. I hope. Blues. I like talking about blues because they're they're another one that don't get bored with blues because there's um, you'll be asked to paint with them a lot, but. Also, uh, blues are interesting because I have three separate blues that I always have on hand and I always tell my students you want to have one of each because they both have their jobs to do. Thalo blue has a very like greenish, more tropical, I think, undertone. Ultramarine is more royal blue, has a uh, more purple undertone. And indigo is such a nice dark punch of color. I use it in place of black a lot. Um, you can see in this running uh, anatomy one in the bones, uh, especially, I use that ultramarine and it, and it leans so much more royal, uh, royal blue purpley. In this one, I use the indigo. I, I mix it with water so it's a lot lighter, but you can still see that desaturated, that more navy tone, and I use that pop of indigo for that little bit of, of hardware there. Um, and this one is more that phthalo blue, especially around the outside where it just has that slightly more tropical undertone. So, and if you try to mix like a purple with a, uh, try to make a purple with a phthalo blue, it doesn't, it looks icky. It doesn't quite work. So having these three blues on hand, I always think is worth it. Purple is my underdog. Um, it's another one that I don't use from a tube. I always recommend mixing it. I uh, mix it with permanent rose and ultramarine, as I just discussed. Um, if you ever try to make blue and red, your kindergarten teacher's wrong if you're working with paint. If you mix plain blue and plain red, it's gonna be like a brownie purple. It's not great. So always mix blue with pink, not blue with purple. All right, blue, you know what I mean. 
Um, blue is, uh, pink, purple is a nice alternative to, to blue. Uh, people don't ask for it as often, but it's just, it's, it's lovely and sweet and it can still be impactful. This is one of my top sellers. It's the uh, lymph, uh, the lymph nodes in the head. Um, and I just love that I could use that grayish purple undertone instead of a teal. Um, and this is a more impactful one. Um, this is a DVT, deep vein thrombosis. And uh, it shows that purple can be also be really impactful, um, especially when paired with that punch of yellow. Okay, I could go on and on and on and on about colors. I didn't even get to talk about the blacks and the grays and the browns and the pinks or making your own palette or all the other things. But I got, I was told I only have 10 to 15 minutes, so I have to stop. But if you have any questions or if you like to talk about colors or anything, people send me pictures of what they're working on and send it to me and I give my feedback on paintings. I just love talking about colors. So if you ever wanted to reach out to me, you can at Caitlin at lionredart.com or see more of my work at um, lionredart.com. And I do have the spot in Wanake, um where I do some, I do some landscapes, but I do like to do hand in the box. Okay, I think that's it. I know that's it. And now I think your studio is going to get packed for those workshops. <laughs> I might attend. Uh, I don't know um, about you guys, but I don't know if I need uh, some of those body parts on my walls, but some of them were absolutely beautiful. So well done. Well done. Um, up next, I'm excited to introduce a chemistry professor from Beloit College who loves art and color. Dr. Kristen Labby incorporates topics at the intersection of chemistry and art into her courses. This is often the chemistry of artist materials, including some pigment synthesis and paint making or technical analysis of art. Kristen will be indulging us with pigment composition and properties and pigment histories, a sort of pigment stories, if you will. Kristen, come on up. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you for having me here. Um, I'm Kristen Labby, and I too love art and science. Um, I was inspired by an excellent high school chemistry teacher, and then I also really liked my um, college chemistry science classes here at UW-Madison. I continued my science training with a little bit of a tour of the Big Ten, um, and now I'm at Beloit College, where I can teach chemistry in some really creative ways and draw on my connections and interest in art. Um, this photo is my instrumental analysis class uh, at the museum after performing some non-destructive technical analysis of some of the paintings at the museum. Um, it's called the Wright Museum. It's a small museum that you could visit. So I wanna start by talking about paint. Um, and the chemistry of paint. It's hard for me to see those behind me. Um, all paint, including watercolor paint, this was an example of a watercolor palette, um, is comprised of pigment and binder. And pigment is um, the colorant, or what gives paint its color. So it tends to be a solid. In this example, which I should be able to point to, um, this rock is a mineral called lapis lazuli, and it can get ground into a fine powder, and you might now see it at artist supply stores in a bottle like this. Um, that would be one example of a pigment. And for watercolors, the binder used, and, and binder is that material that's going to bind and attach the pigment to paper or canvas. Um, the binder used is gum arabic, which is a complex carbohydrate sap from the acacia tree. That's the sap coming out of the tree. Um, and these pieces of sap can get ground into a powder, which can get redissolved in water. And this might be a form that you would see at the art supply store. That gum arabic is often combined with honey and some other additives dissolved in water. And that would be that would look like this, and that would be what you combine with that solid pigment powder to make paint. Um, so watercolor paint would be made by combining these two things, and this is a, an etched rough glass surface, and this tool is called a muller, and lots of time physically mixing those two together. 
um, would make paint. Both oil paint and watercolor paint would be made in this way, uh, and it's a lot of fun to do. Um, we can do it in the lab. You can even do it in the kitchen. If, if you've got some safe pigments, I would not use that cadmium in your kitchen. Um, and you put it in little half pans or whatever you need. So people have been making paint for thousands of years, mixing pigment and binder. Um, this timeline that I created, this might be about the extent of my artistic skills. Um, this timeline that I created, we'll see the times up here. Um, it's not to scale, I really expanded the most recent 500 years because that's when a lot of pigments came um, onto the market, became available, came into use. Um, I'm gonna talk you through a brief tour of the history of pigments and artist materials. Uh, thinking about their chemical compositions. So on my timeline, I gave some of these um, chemical abbreviations from the periodic table. So these ochres contain iron, you'll see cadmium, PB is lead, some pigments contain lead, and so on. I've labeled them with their um, primary element component. And that's useful information for scientists trying to identify pigments in old paintings. We can also consider where these pigments came from or their source. Um, they do tend to be animal, vegetable, mineral, or metals, or some modern pigments are from coal tar or that'd be like petroleum-based um, sources. And so the earliest artist pigments were mineral-based. And this would be what the earliest artist palettes look like. Um, these materials would have been available in prehistoric times. They would have been um, foraged for, ground up, mixed with binders, and used as paint. So we've got some carbon-based blacks that would exist in the form of charcoal, soot, or charred material. Um, chalk whites would be available um, as from lime, um, naturally existing mineral deposits like lime and limestone. Um, and I'm pointing out, again, their predominant elements in composition. And then the ochres provide a really diverse spectrum of color from yellow to red to browns. They're mostly iron-based, so I'm pointing out my Fe iron. And um, the umbers have, sometimes have some magnesium and aluminum in them. And ochres have been used in Paleolithic cave art, some dating as far back as 40,000 years. So those cave paintings you may see images of. Um, and they're still used by artists, including and especially in Aboriginal art. They're pretty common, so this example here. Surprisingly early um, was a synthesized pigment, Egyptian blue. Um, dates back to about 2000 BC. We could call it the first chemical synthesis. It's a very stable compound and um, it is a combination of copper and calcium through silica, which is sand, lime, so that calcium carbonate, um, copper and alkali would be a base heated to an, an astonishing 800 degrees Celsius. So it's very hot and we're not sure how exactly um, those temperatures were reached. Now um, we can do that through, through an oven in the lab, right? Modern technology allows that but um, it's pretty impressive for an ancient pigment. Here's an example of um, the persistence of that. So this is very old, but um, the blue, Egyptian blue persists and is stable. So this is a fun one to synthesize in the lab. Um, this is just my photo of the components, what they look like, and uh, placed and mixed together in this graphite crucible, heated to that really high temperature after several heat and firings of that um, and mixtures, finally, it will look like Egyptian blue. So this was just after one, the green is still there, but you can see those little hints of blue, right? Egyptian blue. Okay, moving forward in time, next, uh, plant and animal-based pigments. Um, this timeline certainly isn't comprehensive. There's lots more pigments, but I just chose a select few. Um, but next, these, um, the matter in carmine lakes, indigo and Tyrian purple um, are 
animal, insect, and plant-based. So evidence of the first indigo use uh, dates back to 3000 BC, but it really came into use in the 16 and 1700s um, and became a really important, um, important trade item, um, source of blue dye in Europe. And again, that's a plant source, the indigo plant. Um, soaked in basic solution will extract this molecule, and this is an organic or carbon-based molecule. When we look at the structure, um, the lines represent bonds between carbon atoms. So at each of these uh, points or vertexes around the six-membered ring is a carbon atom. So there's a lot of carbon in this. It's an organic molecule, very different from those mineral-based molecules that we saw before. So indigo causes, or um, is that really deep blue pigment. Tyrian purple has a great story behind it too. Um, was... The, the first purple that's associated with royalty. So it was really hard to obtain um, because it was extracted from marine snails, lots of them, so it's a shell of a snail, boiled um, with a combination of urine, wood ash, and water. So as you would imagine, a very smelly process. Um, extracted this organic molecule that when um, bound with a mordant would be become a solid pigment. So that was our first purple pigment. And similarly, the Carmine Lake um, and its relative matter lake. Carmine Lake is extracted from cochineal beetles. So these dried little beetles um, grow on or live on and can be harvested from the prickly pear cacti. And this would be the molecule, again, an organic carbon-based molecule with some oxygens attached. Um, would be extracted from that, that's responsible for that red color. And this is a fun process to do in the lab as well. So this is a photo of some matter root, um, then getting extracted in the dye bath and the resultant pigment right there. Um, what's going on here with these four different flasks is depending on your source, the cochineal beetles or the matter root, that's a plant, um, or the root of a plant, and um, the specific metal you use as a mordant to bind to the organic molecule and precipitate it out as pigment. Depending on the combination you use there, you can get a different shade or tone or color. So you're seeing those four different colors right there. All right, and moving forward in time, we're doing another big jump and we're not gonna be able to talk about all of these but here's where some modern synthesis really took off. We've got a lot of metal-based yellows that became available, um, but I wanted to focus on two stories down here, Prussian blue and mauveine. So Prussian blue um, was, yeah, paving the way towards modern chemical synthesis. This is a fun uh, accidental discovery. So it's an iron-based pigment and this quote here, the blue that was supposed to be red came from this lovely book from Victoria Finlay filled with pig more pigment stories like this. And it was Johann Diesbach trying to make Carmine Lake red, um, but some, some of his starting material was contaminated with blood, which contains hemoglobin, which contains iron. Um, and he accidentally made a rich blue. And he followed through and figured out what went wrong and did come up with the recipe of Prussian blue based on that. So it could have just been an accident that he pushed aside, but he persisted and figured out what happened and then Prussian blue um, came into use. So it's a, actually a pretty, now, now that we know that, it's a pretty simple synthesis, combining two iron-based chemicals and it's a very quick, easy thing to do in the lab. Makes this really rich blue solid, pretty quickly can be filtered and isolated and, and used. Prussian blue is also what's formed in the process of cyanotypes. So if you've ever made those or had kids that, that make those, um, Prussian blue is what's forming in response to the light, um, the regions that get hit with sunlight. So the shadowed regions, uh, Prussian blue does not form. So you're making Prussian blue, you're doing pigment synthesis when you're making cyanotypes. 
And mauveine was also a bit of an accidental discovery. Victoria Finlay calls this one a chemistry project gone wrong. William Henry Perkin um, was trying to make quinine uh, a malaria treatment molecule uh, from coal tar. And coal tar is that is black sludge that would be left behind after coal was burned. We're probably not as familiar with that today. But it would be an organic, a source of organic molecules, very carbon rich. Um, so he had several reactions that were dubbed failed, but while he was cleaning out his glassware for, with all of that resultant black sludge, um, he saw some purple and he persisted and tried to figure out um, where that purple was coming from. He worked to isolate it from the black sludge and figure out how it was made. And this launched the synthetic dye industry of the 19 1870s and was a much easier way to obtain purple than the smelly snail way that was previously known. Um, this story is really well described in Perkins' Perfect Purple, this book over here. Um, it's beautifully illustrated and it's a children's book, but I would recommend it for all audiences. To give you a quick glimpse at how coal tar or other petroleum mixtures of organic molecules can come together and form a new dye molecule, this color-coded image sort of shows you that coal tar would contain these molecules and they need to bond together in the right pattern to create these mauveine molecules, like mauveine A or mauveine B. This came from an article that describes the, the modern synthesis, how would we, we would do that today. Okay, so what can we do with all of our historical and chemical information about pigments? Um, well, scientists can use pigment timelines and elemental analysis techniques to determine pigments used by artists. So these are two of my scientist friends who um, had the privilege of being able to analyze this Van Gogh painting. And they had some historical information, including letters as well as Van Gogh's um, physical paint palette that um, suggested, strongly suggested, he had used a pigment called Germanium Lake, sorry, Geranium Lake, Germanium's an element, Geranium, um, like the flowers. So similar to carmine, you could extract and make a lake pigment from geraniums. Um, so there was evidence he had used that. And um, in some of his letters to his brother, the flowers in the foreground here were described as pink. But today, they now appear white. So the chemist thought about that a little bit, thought about um, the known molecular structure of the components of geranium lake, which would be this molecule here, eosin B. And maybe you recognize we've got a bunch of these carbon rings with some oxygens attached. And we've got some bromines. Those are a little unique. We didn't see many of those on my pigment timeline, if you were paying attention. There was a lot of iron, some cadmium, some lead. So some bromines would be pretty unique. Um, and we also know there's pretty good documentation of what Van Gogh was using. None of the other pigments that he would have used would contain bromine. Um, so that combined with the avail availability of handheld x-ray analysis technique that is able to determine which elements are present would be able to tell us more about which sites on the painting contained bromine therefore would have likely contained and originally been painted with ger geranium lake, but in time had faded. Um, the molecule would have decomposed and faded, so the pink color would go away. So they set about with this handheld x-ray tool, which has a sample site of about a centimeter squared, so a pretty small sample site, and they carefully documented all of the white flowers throughout the painting, mostly in the foreground. Um, they came up with and they mapped, there's 387 flowers in sites. And after going through them, they found that 146 of them contained bromine. Therefore, were probably, or were most likely, originally painted with geranium lake. So I'll go back. That's what the painting looks like today. After finding that 146 of these sites uh, contained bromine, therefore were probably originally painted with geranium lake uh, and were pink, 
they, con they conducted, constructed this digital reconstruction. Um, so we can travel through time with chemistry and see what this painting originally looked like when Van Gogh painted it. Um, it allows us to understand Van, Van Gogh, the artist's original intent. And there's actually lots of other stories like this, and there was a great exhibit in Chicago um, featuring some of these recently, too. So hopefully you can see that pigments are at the crossroads of science and art. We can synthesize new or old, like Egyptian blue, pigments in the lab. Uh, we can make paint, combining our pigment and binder, and we can perform chemical analysis to learn about paintings. To learn more, about any of these stories. These are my favorite resources, and I did physically bring all of my copies of them. These two are a great tour of pigments and color and the history of each of those. Found and Ground is about paint making, which is a lot of fun. So that binding or grinding your pigment and binder together to form paint. And Perkins Perfect Purple is a great story about art and chemistry. So thank you. Thank you, Kristen. That was awesome. I don't know about you all, but that just gives me a sort of renewed sense of appreciation for my favorite colors. Um, so just knowing some of those stories that exist, now I kind of want to go investigate. Um, up next, we have Professor Karen Sloss, who studies visual perception and cognition with a focus on how color preferences are formed, how colors influence judgment and decision making, and how colors communicate meaning in information visualizations. Although her main interests are on color, she also studies perceptual organization and visual illusions with an emphasis on configural elements and bias perception. Karen, please come to the stage. Hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, so my name's Karen Schloss. I'm an associate professor here in the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery, so in, in this building here in the Department of Psychology. Um, my life to date, I've always been fascinated with color ever since I was yay big. My favorite activity was organizing my crayons, um, way more than playing with dolls. Um, but I didn't find my passion for science until college, actually. Um, so I did my BA at Barnard, go Bears, uh, PhD at Berkeley, go Bears. I was at Brown for a little while, go Bears, and now I'm here at UW, go Badgers. <laughs> okay, um, so I want to ask the question, what is a color? We spent a lot of time talking about color tonight. What is a color? Now, this is a um, deep philosophical question, and we could, I'm sure everyone in this room might have their own perspective from their own discipline. I come at this problem from a psychologist who studies perception. Um, and so one way we could talk about color is in terms of our visual experience. So this particular red here has some amount of lightness, redness, saturation. We can describe any color we could see in terms of its perceptual dimensions, so lightness, hue, and chroma. Um, but in addition to our just perceptual experience of the color, colors can also be symbolic representations. And so this particular red can be associated with strawberries and poisonous frogs and UW Madison and the human heart and so on. Um, and each one of these um, associations has associated messages. So for example, um, strawberries might be delicious, poisonous frogs are dangerous, go badgers, and maybe the human heart is you or cool depending on who you are and what your background is and how you think about anatomy. Um, and so in my perspective, um, the fact that color can be um, a symbolic representation with associated messages makes color a really powerful tool for communication. And so that's what my lab large focuses on is communication. Um, now, I'm going to actually um, compare um, with Caitlin's initial um, description of the color of, so the color of science versus the science of color um, and say that from my perspective, I study the science of color as opposed to the color of science. Um, so my question um, is, or I have several questions. One is, what associations do people have with colors? And where do those associations come from in the first place? Why are some colors more you and gross versus attractive? Um, what determines color beauty? So what is the relationship between beauty um, and interpretability? 
Um, color can um, be used in lots of different ways. And my question um, in my lab is, how can we use color in an optimal way that balances things like perceptual discriminability, so being able to tell the difference between colors, um, aesthetics, so people liking colors, and also semantics, so color communicating meaning. Um, and I, when I wrote this number 18 on this slide, I felt really old. Um, so this is learned through 18 years of exp um, experiments studying human perception and cognition in the laboratory. Okay. So diving into my work. So my work is largely motivated by what I call the color inference framework. And the idea is that people, as we're moving about the world, we're continually forming in our associations between colors and concepts. And we update these with new experiences. So these, I'm showing you um, color concept association spaces for the concept watermelon, raspberry, and avocado. Each point represents a color that we can see uniformly sampled over a perceptual space. And the width of these bars corresponds to how associated that color is with the concept written above. So we can see that raspberries have a lot of weight on reds and purples, watermelons are mixed between reds and greens, and so on. And the idea is that for every concept that you know about, you're continually forming and updating these associations with your experiences, whether you know it or not. These associations are stored in what I call a color concept association network, and this connects all possible colors that we can see to all possible concepts we know about. And this doesn't mean that this network is like literally living in your brain right now, but thinking about colors in this way helps us understand aspects of behavior. Because we can think about different kinds of computations you can do on this network that lead to different kinds of judgments. So, um, oh, and sorry, different parts of this network are active at different times. So depending on the colors you're looking at and the concepts you're thinking about, different parts will become more or less active. Okay, um, so there's two, um, two kinds of operations that I've been studying that people do on this network um, that lead to different kinds of judgments. So color pooling, which we're gonna talk mostly about today, leads to judgments of color preferences. So your associations with colors leading to how much you like that particular color. Um, and assignment leads to interpretations of colors and information visualizations, like graphs, maps, weather maps, diagrams, signs. Um, but for now, we're gonna focus um, this talk today on preferences for color, so our emotional reaction to colors. So why do people like the colors they like? And why do people even have color preferences in the first place? To address this question, um, my colleague Steve Palmer and I proposed the ecological valence theory. And the idea is this. You like colors that remind you of things you like, like clear sky, ripe raspberries, rolling hills, sunsets. And you dislike colors that remind you of things you dislike, like sewage water and rotting fruit, and that's mold, and I spared you the picture of the vomit. And the idea is that these color preferences can actually act as a steering function that guide us to act um, appropriately in the world. So for example, if you are more attracted to say the ripe strawberry than the rotting fruit, you might be more inclined to seek out these kinds of experiences that are gonna be healthier and lead to greater success overall. Um, so it's possible that color preferences actually kind of got built into us as um, a system of learning to, for it to be adaptive for our survival and success. Okay. So this is a lovely idea, but how can you actually test a theory like this in the lab? Well, um, what we did um, was we posed the research question, do color preferences increase with preferences for objects associated with colors? And we addressed this question with four different groups of participants. So the first came into the lab, we showed them a bunch of colors one at a time, and they rated how much they liked that color on a scale from not at all to very much. So that was our group number one, we'll put them over here. Our second group, whoops, can you stay there? Our second group came into the lab um, and they saw those same colors again, but they weren't asked anything about preference. We just told them, write down all of the things that you think about when you see this color. So that got us our object associations. Okay. The third group was given those object associations as verbal descriptions. So they were not presented with colored squares at all. They just saw the word, say, tropical ocean, and they said how positive versus negative that thing was. Finally, our last group um, saw the object descriptions and the colors and they, saw, and they rated how well they matched. And that allowed us to be able to basically downweight the, the bad descriptions. Okay, um, so together with these data sets, we were able to calculate what we call the weighted effective valence estimate. And what this is, is a single number that represents how much people on average like all of the objects that are associated with the given color. So that's from our group two, three, and four. And critically, the people who gave those data never judged their color preferences. Okay, so now we can ask, are these weighted effective valence estimates or preferences for objects associated with colors predictive of other people's color preferences? 
So here I'm going to show you first color preferences, which is a pretty standard um, uh, pattern of results. So the y-axis is mean color preference, so higher means the color is more liked on average. The x-axis is hue, so red, orange, yellow, chartreuse, green, cyan, blue, and purple. And the separate lines are different saturation and lightness levels. So those are the color preferences. And here are the waves. So remember, these waves were collected by people who did not judge their preferences for colors at all. They said how much they liked objects that were associated with colors. The correlation between these um, is quite high, um, and they have the same general patterns as you can see. So overall, a hallmark pattern of color preferences on average is a peak around blue and a trough around yellow. We see that in both. And also this deep dip around dark yellow, the vomit color where I spared you the picture of vomit. Okay, um, so with this theory in hand, we can then ask why are color preferences um, oops, um, varying with lots of different kinds of things? So individual differences, why, do there, why are there individual differences in color preference? Well, there should be individual differences in color preferences to the extent that we have different um, color-related experiences. So we might experience different color-related objects, and we also might have different preferences for those objects. So all else equal, I hate Brussels sprouts. If you like Brussels sprouts, you should like green more than I do, is what the theory implies. Um, and we found evidence for this in the lab through looking at individual differences um, in color preferences. Same goes for cultural differences. So culture should have different color preferences to the extent that there's different preferences for objects associated with colors across culture. Um, and we found evidence for this as well. Seasonal changes. So colors should and do change according to the seasons as different color associated objects become more or less active in our minds. So we did a study looking at the same people's color preferences starting in September all the way through December and they came back into the lab nine different times and we could track their color preferences changing over time. And the preferences for the autumn leafy kinds of colors increased over the course of autumn and then came back down as the leaves fell in December. But there were individual differences. So for the people who loved fall associated things like pumpkin spice lattes and hay rides and things like that had really positive increases and those who didn't like those things didn't increase as much. So it's really tied to your relationship with these objects that are color associated. Okay, developmental changes. So um, my, this is a study led by um, my colleagues in the UK found that infants have really different color preferences or at least looking biases than adults. And we think these might be related to these ecological associations um, as well. Um, and finally, recent experiences can change our color preferences. And this last one I'm going to unpack for you with one last study. Okay, so in this study, we wanted to know if we could change people's color preferences in the laboratory within one testing session. So what we did was we brought people into the lab and we had them judge their preferences for the set of colors um, that we judged before. Um, so they just rated how much they liked each color. And then we divided them into two groups. One group saw images of positive red things like raspberries, negative green things, like pond scum, and neutral other colored things. The other group saw negative red things, positive green things, and then the same neutral other colored things. And when they saw these, they did what we called spatial aesthetics tasks. So we wanted them to think that these were separate tasks, not part of the color preference experiment. So one experimenter did the color preference task, and then we said, um, do you mind doing some other tasks? And so the participants said, sure. And then another, a part, another experimenter came in and administered the spatial aesthetics tasks. Um, so the participants said how good a label was for the image, this is to make sure we, they knew what it was in the image. Um, they clicked on the center of the images, they rated how spatially complex the images were, and they judged how much they liked the objects in the image. And then once this was done, the first experimenter came back and said, actually, can we get a little bit more color preference data from you? And the participants said, sure. Um, and so then they rated their color preferences again. Um, and so then we looked at differences before and after this object dis um, exposure. And critically, any participant who had any slight idea that we were trying to change their color preferences were excluded from the analysis. Most people really did not know. But if people had any sort of idea that these tasks were related, they were, their data were set aside. Okay. So now we're going to look at the data where the y-axis is change in preference. So positive means they liked the color more after exposure to the images. Negative means they liked it less. And we're going to look at this for our group who saw positive red things and negative green things first. So there, people who saw positive red things had a significant increase in preference for red um, and a small decrease in preference for green. And participants in the other group who saw positive green things and negative red things had the opposite pattern. So now we were able to manipulate color preferences in the lab um, for the neutral, um, the, the neutral um, valence objects. These were nice right there in the middle. What is the negative red image? That is an eyeball with, um, I think, either a pink eye or some sort of bloodshot eye. Thank you for asking. You can make it not gross. Let's, what do you paint it purple? <laughs> um, 
<laughs> yeah, there were also surgeries and all the things. Okay, but critically, for some people, that might not be so gross. So some of our, our participants were pre-med. And for them, the anatomy was kind of cool. So we wanted to know if people's individual reactions to these things actually predicted how much their color preferences changed. So for each person, what we did was we calculated the difference for the red versus green changes in preference and looked at if that was related to how much they liked the red versus green things. Logic being that people who were not at all grossed out by negative red things wouldn't have a decrease in preference for red. Um, and we did find a significant correlation with um, those object preference differences and the color preference changes. So that does really suggest that our individual experiences are driving our relationships or our preferences for color. Okay, um, so I started off with the color inference framework and highlighted that um, I was gonna talk about color preferences today. Most of my work now um, is mostly on interpretations of colors in data visualizations. Um, and so I'm not gonna talk about that today, um, but if you're interested, you can check out my website. I'd be happy to chat with you afterwards. Um, so ultimately, um, my lab, the Visual Reasoning Lab, aims to understand what determines color meaning um, with, the goal of the with the goal of making the world easier um, for people to interpret and more enjoyable to experience. So, thank you. That's all. All right. Well, yeah, find a seat. So while everybody is, uh, or all the panelists are coming on up, um, just really quickly wanted to give a shout out and thank you first and foremost to the Madison Watercolor Society for joining us this evening. Uh, we have several of the artists here tonight. Their artwork, as you've already kind of uh, gotten around is on display in the back and will be on display until the end of the evening. And so uh, if you didn't get a chance and you came in a li little late, please go back there, grab some information on the brochures that they brought as well. I have some conversations with some local Madison artists. Um, also need to give a shout out to Dane Arts. They also helped this, uh, this program tonight as well as artists and craftsmen who gave us some watercolor pads and stickers for you guys to grab on your way out. And last but not least, Faber Castell, who gave me 800 pencils and prompted much of this evening. Um, so please take home some watercolor pencils. Be sure to sign your email on the um, on the list. That way we can contact you for future uh, crossroads and other fun things that we do here, like sound waves and so forth. But that is. Um, it's been a whirlwind to kind of go through this. I feel like I, everything I look at is just going to be so different now. Every I'm looking at the blue in the ceiling, the, the wood grain in the walls. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to ever buy the same car color or curtains, or if I'm gonna be in the grocery store and feel frustrated because this is red, and is it good to buy that red, or is that too yellow? I don't know. So I mean, I can go on, and I don't wanna take over this conversation, and I can tell I saw some people wanted to jump with questions, and so I wanna just go straight to questions for the audience and see you know, what kind of questions you guys might have, but also leave it open for the panelists. If there are things that you didn't get to share that you feel you really are eager to share, let's kind of have that open conversation. And which, like, you guys aren't even like waiting, you're like, yes, let's go. So we have a microphone, mm, we have one microphone, which is gonna make its way over to you and then we'll kind of go around. I just I have a few comments about the speakers to the three K's. It's Caitlin, Kristen, and Karen. Yeah. Um, Caitlin, uh, when you studied medical illustration, did you have to do three years of medical school? No, fortunately. Oh. Um, I, took, I took classes with the med students, PT students, actually mostly PT students and dental students. So when I was a student here in the 70s, I was going to go the medical illustration oh. track and you had to go to medical school. Oh. Uh, it was UCLA, Toronto, uh, John uh, Hopkins. Johns Hopkins, their, yes. yep, their program still so open. So it was going to be like a very expensive avenue, so I never went that way. Yeah. But I was just curious. Um, and Kristen, I loved your chemistry. That book, my daughter purchased that for me for a gift. Uh, it's written by a UK author, and there's another one, The Secret Lives of Thread or something like that. And that's wonderful. Okay, the Cassia uh, St. Clair book? Yes. The Secret Life yes. of Color? Awesome. Yes. And uh, I loved your chemistry background. And Karen, um, you're a psychologist focusing. Um, I switched from being an art teacher and becoming a nurse. And we had to do uh, personality sensitive training at UW Hospital and Clinics. And we had to take this class and they put personality colors 
if you were a red, a brown person, or a blue person. And there, there might have been a green, I can't remember. But it was interesting because you had to understand sensitivity of personalities. Were you ever affiliated with that? The psychological aspects of personalities and colors? Um, no, so I haven't done much work related to personality of colors. Um, to my knowledge, there, the science of that is not as robust. <laughs> well, it faded out. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, I, I, I think those the four color test I've seen um, used in a lot of different corporate settings, and it's a good way to block people off, but also limit their ability and their individuality. So I appreciate that comment, Karen. Okay, I had, first of all, for the first presentation, um, I, I, I was curious. Uh, the uh, images that you displayed here um, don't look like they would be faithful enough to be used in technical publications or textbooks. I mean, they were too, uh, I guess, fancifully drawn and colored. So I was curious, who were the primary customers for uh, that type of illustration? Then I was gonna go on to the second uh, presentation. Um, what was the purpose of the analysis of the Van Gogh painting? Was forgery or something suspected? Was that the reason why they wanted mm -hmm. to analyze it in such depth? And also, what is the technical meaning of lake? It came up twice, mm -hmm. Carmine Lake and then Indigo Lake. Believe. I was curious what it meant in a scientific context. Thank you. Sure. Um, no, you should not put those in a textbook. I like to say that they're accurate, but but I, I would not trust a person who is only educated by my paintings. So, <laughs> although I have painted four textbooks, but it's a very different style. Um, so my primary audience, it's, it's kind of threefold. One, um, I go up, my work goes up in a lot of clinics um, and in hospitals sometimes, so just a, a beauty component. Um, and then for, to make things more pleasant for the patients. And then I get a lot of customers who um, have gone through something traumatic uh, and they want to commemorate that with uh, an abstract rendition of the cancer that they beat um, or some sort of hardship that they've gone through. And if you can make that, that thing beautiful, it kind of empowers them, um, apparently. And, um, and, then, and then books and such. I do, I do illustrations for pamphlets and journals and books and, and things like that. So that's where my paintings end up. Uh, that's, I would much rather see your paintings in a clinic than the <laughs> motivational poster of the kitty hanging in there. Right. <laughs> well, it's funny, I, was, I have a dis an exhibition up permanently at the Omaha Children's Hospital and they commissioned me, an anatomy artist, to paint lots of birds because they thought it would be too, too intense for the children. So, mm. so yes, yeah, we do get that sometimes. Kristen, tell us about Lake. Yes. Oh, well, first, that Van Gogh painting was analyzed because the, the historical information, those letters between, I think it was Van Gogh and his brother, were describing those pink flowers. And then we look at the painting and we didn't see any, the pink is not there anymore. So that's what prompted that analysis. Um, lakes are dye molecules, which are organic molecules, which would, dye molecules would be soluble in water. Pigment molecules would not dissolve in water right away. You can get a dye molecule um, to become a pigment, to become insoluble in a solid, if you lake it or bind a metal to it. So that's, that's what that means. I didn't have time to explain all of that. I just kind of snuck that in there. Some of these pigments are actually um, complex organic molecules. And then um, if you're familiar with the dyeing process, I think it's called the mordant. So it's either alum, aluminum-based. You could also use calcium or sodium. That's how we were getting different colors playing around with the mordant. Um, and that's what caused it to be more of a solid, precipitate out, and then you can collect that and mix it with a binder to make paint. Yeah, that's what the lakes are. Uh, I kept thinking uh -huh. blue when you said lake. Ah, yeah, yeah, naturally. Yeah, so I see that is still on paint tubes today, right? The lakes are available. Karen's pistons are firing lake association colors. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've seen it on ingredient packages and always wondered what it meant. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Kristen. 
Yeah, I, I feel like, so like thinking about the, the preservation of artwork, and I don't know if there's anyone in here who might be an expert in this area too, but thinking about that preservation and using the uh, technologies that we have today to understand what actually artists were using 100, 1,000 years ago, and I wonder if there's maybe potential for a movement of art today to try to recreate some of those processes so that way their artwork purposely decays and degrades and becomes sort of an evolution over time or evolves over time. Mm -hmm. I think there's a, something fascinating about that on top of the preservation and the actual recognition that this is a true Van Gogh. Right. Yep, that's a really complicated process to think about how art was originally created, how it ages over time. Now that we know what it's like, it's not ethically correct to bring it back to that. We don't modify it. Um, this is the role of the conservator. So there's distinct roles for a scientist to just gather the data and present that information. Then the ethics come in from, I think, the conservator. Um, some other people, not my job. Because it gets really complicated, right? Sure, sure. <laughs> Anyone? So I guess one of the things that really comes to mind, especially like talking about like the development of pigments over time is like now we're like exposed to, we've got like so many more synthetic pigments. We've got like, we can make like non-pigmented colors like iridescences that are like mm -hmm. structural mm -hmm. things or maybe that's a pigment too. Um, the idea of like, like printing techniques or like digital displays are, are allowing us to display all these colors that we, you know, like I, I'm just thinking like historically, how, how might that exposure to all this diversity of colors like change how we make decisions or like how we're perceiving these things because mm -hmm. we're just exposed to so many more, uh, so many more colors. And then also how that might affect like the artistic process. Whereas before you might have like, you know, your, 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 your crayon box of, you know, 16 colors and now you have like 16 million colors to choose from. And, you know, as an artist, how might that affect you as well? As, as an artist, I, I think there's two different reactions to today having so many colors, if you will, and also s so much more everything. Um, art is not just 2D, it's, 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 it's everything nowadays. And one, there, I think there's a visceral reaction to be a little bit bored by the paintings of the past because, because of the limitations. But then I kind of feel like the pendulum is also uh, swinging the other way and we're kind of getting back to our roots and getting an appreciation. So now we know AI could have created all of these amazing new things, so it makes it actually cooler that it was created by a human or it was using a, uh, a pigment that they created on their own or uh, a pigment of the past. So there's a new appreciation just because it's becoming more rare to, to narrow that focus. Um, so that's, that's what I hope at least because I'm a traditional artist. Karen, do you, I was gonna say, One. do you have anything on that saturation of colors like in our everyday environment? Do you think that influences or sort of de-incentivizes some of the choices that we make it's just in our day-to-day, -day, like when you talk about visualization and such? Yeah, so there was an argument by someone named Humphrey from 1971 who said that um, in evolutionary time and in the animal kingdom, color is extremely meaningful. And then what has happened is that once humans started making synthetic or artificial objects where they can be arbitrarily colored, then color has lost its currency. The color is not meaningful anymore. And I take the opposite view of that, which is that for any single concept, we can associate it with any possible color to varying degrees. And we can use that to leverage design to make communication easier. And so I think that um, just because color can be used in arbitrary ways doesn't mean that our associations are arbitrary. In fact, they're definitely not. Um, and understanding those associations can uh, allow us to use color in a really robust and powerful way. So I don't think that having more colorful worlds than we did, um, I guess, when we evolved, <laughs> um, it means that color is not um, meaningful. I think we can use it in really creative um, and scientifically supported ways to facilitate communication. We have more questions. Oh, we're already. Um, right. A couple of questions, thoughts for um, Dr. Schloss. Um, one is to follow up on what you just said. When I was listening to you know the last piece on the 
sort of like a manipulation of perception, right, um, in the lab. And in my work related to diversity, of course, I'm thinking about colorism in terms of the range of our skin tone and how that's led to, you know, so much different perception and how might your study can be related or help people to, to have positive relationship with the different tone of our skin, right? So that, that's just a thought I had, and, and you can respond to that later. And second, thought, second part of it is um, I have a, a blind person in my family, so I was thinking about your study in relation to how does it work with, you know, if, if the person or the people are blind and sort of what then construct their perception of color? Yeah, those are great questions. So the second one, so people who are blind don't, um, I assuming that they've been blind from, from birth, um, they don't have firsthand perceptual color experiences but they hear people talk about color all the time. And so there's evidence suggests that they have really rich color concept associations as well. Um, and so one question, an empirical question that I have is if we measured their associations, um, can we predict their color preferences? If we measured their associations, could we predict their interpretations of color meaning in information visualization when they're hearing people talk about visualizations even if they're not seeing them? So our theory suggests that 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 should work, um, and so it's something that I'd be super interested in testing, or if someone else tested to learn about the results. Um, so yeah, the associations are there, though, and the associations are the kind of the source then of the interpretations of color, color preferences. So it should, it, I would think it would play out, but it, it is an empirical question um, regarding skin color. So um, that's a that's a real complicated one, and so people's. Um, um, negative or, or positive reactions to particular cultures are so deeply seeded by so many things that I don't think that priming people to think of a positive um, thing associated with a particular color would necessarily change those social constructs. Um, it could possibly in the context of like um, an IET implicit aptitude test. Like you might be able to train people in the lab to form different associations and then maybe it would come out in that kind of implicit measure, but whether that actually would impact like actual racism in the world, I would be skeptical. Um, it'd be cool if it could work, but I think those issues are a lot deeper than um, our associations just with, with color. Hi, I had a question for Karen. Um, are there any hypotheses of the reason why humans evolved to see color? Yes, um, so one hypothesis is that um, we evolved to be able to discriminate different colors to be able to um, find food. So to be able to discriminate reds versus green to basically find berries against leaves. And so those um, primates who had that discriminability were more likely to find food and then survive and reproduce is one hypothesis. Other people have argued that it has to do with um, emotional communication. So as you are expressing emotions, your skin color changes in really systematic ways. And so it could be that our ability to detect uh, or discriminate colors evolved from our ability to actually read other people's faces, which then lead, led to possibly more productive interactions and survival and reproduction. So those are two hypotheses that um, it came from those. But the idea is that there was evolutionary pressures that um, favored being able to discriminate colors, whether it's food and nourishment or social interactions or both or some other thing that's likely what, there was some sort of pressure that, um, that supported the um, having trichromatic color vision. Uh, so this is more of a comment than directed at any of the three of you. I'm sitting back here looking at the painting that's behind you, and I'm noting that um, it's a really, really great example of granulation, which is the pigments. You have two main pigments in this painting, the um, ultramarine and then the earth colors, and um, they're bound in that um, gum arabic, but then when you add water, those little granules separate back out based on their weight, and you can tell me, Chris, and all the other factors that go into it. And um, artists use this very intentionally to get an atmospheric um, painting based on the 
weight of the particles in the tank. That's kind of what I, we were talking about this yesterday. That's uh, uh, certain pigments uh, have more of that reaction, and I never really knew why until I read through her PowerPoint. I was like, oh, because they're made from minerals, and that's why I get they're they're a heavier weight. So yes, okay. I figured something out this so week. So it could be solubility. If it's a less water-loving type molecule, um, the particle size, right? There, there's differences between hand-ground pigments. We'll have very um, ununiform particle size. Commercially, synthetically produced in big manufacturing plants, we'll have more uniform and probably smaller particle size. Those sorts of properties, maybe. Right. Pretty. I think we have time for maybe one more question. I have no idea what time it really is. So uh, we, uh, I'll ask a quick question to all of the speakers. Um, we've heard a lot about learning uh, through through the learning process that you've all gone through, and that you've also all touched a little bit on innovation or sudden changes. So a learning process is slow, and a, an innovation is a, a rapid change. Could could each of you comment on what is the key innovation that has uh, uh, fostered your science or your talk? Uh, today? Mm. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, could, I could maybe go, and it kind of gets back to an earlier question about um, color and, and modern pigments and light today. Um, I didn't quite point out, but the phthalo green was first synthesized in, I think, 1938, sort of represents um, the, the outburst of modern sick synthesis of pigments. Now we can make almost any color, uh, any molecule that has an output of any color we want, and there's thousands of colors available, um, and it's they're, they're all carbon-based and organic, so we can't use that same um, elemental differences. So on my pigment timeline, I was pointing out iron is only in a, a finite number of pigments. So if we see iron, that's pretty good evidence it's only a few things. Cadmium, lead, there's some giveaways and some certainty there. But um, the 1930s and starting to use petroleum uh, to make just this whole slew of, of pigments really um, exploded artist materials, um, but also in a good way because we could make color versions that replace the the cadmium reds and yellows, but maybe never not replace oh, never cadmium. replace. Some <laughs> some don't do it. Okay, hard stop. Um, but but they'll be safer, so we can put them into uh, children's paints. There you go. Okay. <laughs> um, so the innovation. I work with a lot of innovations, um, so. What I think what led to the innovations that allowed me to present today are the same ones that Kristen's talking about, the innovations of colors that's made, made the range that I get to use. Because I would say the majority of what I use came from the past, for using your chart, the past uh, 50 years, uh, 100 years or so. Um, just the indigo and there is, and the Prussian blue, I do use those, Prussian blue. Some um, of those are pretty old, actually. So the yeah. synthesis of the colors is, is probably the innovation I use the most. Um, day to day as an artist, the innovation that I use is the reproducibility of art. So um, talking about scanners, you're talking about computers, so that I can, I can edit things, I can reproduce it just like I painted, so I can send it out to the masses. So that's probably the most important thing I do to make my career a success at this point. I hope that was okay. <laughs> I'm grateful to have had the time to think through my answer. Thank you both for going first. <laughs> Um, so in thinking through <laughs> my answer, I was thinking about what were the studies like on color preferences 100 years ago, and what are mine like, and what, what's changed? So back in the, or over 100 years at this point, back in the late 1800s, um, people argued that color preferences were too idiosyncratic to even study. And what were they doing? They showed people um, like construction paper, like colored papers of maybe six different colors, um, and we have no idea what colors they were, and we can say what they're in red, blue, but like what they actually saw, we have no idea. And the statistical methods weren't there to be able to analyze the responses in a rigorous way, and people, and they were presented on paper, and so people made a couple judgments, and that was it. 
Since then, we've got huge advances in statistical methods. We've got advances in computing, advances in color calibration. So I can say exactly what colors I displayed on my monitor so that my collaborators in Japan can calibrate their monitor and say that they're showing their participants the exact same colors, which allows us to make comparisons um, across the globe. Um, and so I think those are the, the big advances that have allow me to do the work that I do. So the advances in statistics and advances in um, digital rendering and calibration um, to do the rigorous science. Outstanding. I almost want to tug on a shred, uh, on a thread uh, from you, Caitlin, too, because I feel like, and I might be wrong, but it, to me, when I see your artwork and the way that you uh, adapt uh, different colors from what we're used to seeing, I feel like that in itself is almost an innovation. Like that is your innovation on sort of bringing back I am the, the best light. innovation. That yes, is. exactly, exactly. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't know if that's, is that a standard that's been adopted out there, or are you, uh, you know, kind of one of the, the unique ones who for, brought that? I, I will, for adjusting the colors and making the gross into not gross, just by adjusting colors or orientation or how much I zoom in, on, on the market, I was one of the first. Now, now, now I have some competition, and they do copy a little bit, but it's fine. It's totally fine. It's a compliment. <laughs> um, but yes, that that was my approach. The the one, the artist that I uh, liken myself to, ideally, but O'Keefe. She didn't adjust her colors like I do, but she took these regular objects and, and made them like very zoomed in and through composition um, and uh, the way she highlighted them through sim simplicity. Um, I think she was an innovator in that and I kind of piggyback off of her. So. Very nice, very nice. Well, um, I think we've all uh, given uh, a different perspective Quite literally, uh, on how to move forward on the way we use color, the way we buy color, the way we look at it, the way we treat it, the way we appreciate it, all of those things. And I just want to say thank you to the panelists. Uh, thank each of you. I think this has been a wonderful talk, and we're grateful to have you join us with the Crossroads of Ideas. And so with that, I just want to give an applause. And... For all of you here, um, be sure to, uh, if you need to go back to the website to find links to our panelists here, um, to reach out to them, to go to the studios, to come to other talks, to maybe invite them to do pigment creating workshops, I don't know, whatever, come find them. Um, and please be sure, if I'm going to get yelled at if I don't read this, um, to... Um, Please be sure to look out for future Crossroads emails. We, of course, have three more coming in the spring semester. Um, but if you're really excited to do something, again, Crossroads vibes uh, wise, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, next week, we have something that was prompted from our previous Crossroads, which is called uh, a movie called There Are No Bugs in Winter, which was um, produced by one of last, last month's Crossroads and um, Crossroads presenters. And that's going to be screening in two different places next week on the, oh, thank you so much, uh, on the 12th and the 14th, um, one at the Marquee Cinema across the street at Union South, and the other at the Madison Central Library. Uh, the movie is free, and um, it is a really cool movie uh, presented by one of the WID research, or produced by one of the two WID, WID researchers, Dr. Claudia Lois Summers. Uh, she is over there. Um, so please, if you can, come on out and say hello and watch a free movie. Um, that is all. You are all free to go. Thank you so much. And have a good holiday. Thank you.